This is uh, our episode now. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 48. Um, now, if you haven't watched any of my other videos, I ask you to take a look at uh, episode 17. I did a series of seven videos on Ephraim and Manasseh, particularly video number six and seven the day of Jezreel and Bethlehem of Ephrathah. Um, that, that, those two videos prepare for this, uh, so they don't have to explain a whole lot of stuff. So if you haven't seen those videos, I urge you to watch those first, or you can just follow along. Now, I guess the first thing I'll do is just read through this and we might stop and look at it as we go. Genesis chapter 48. This is where uh, Jacob blesses the two sons of jo Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh. Starting in verse 1, It came to pass after these things that one told Joseph, Behold, thy father is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And one told Jacob, and said, Behold, thy son Joseph cometh to unto thee. And Israel strengthened himself, and sat upon the bed. Jacob is Israel. And Jacob said unto Joseph, God Almighty appeared unto me at Luz, in the land of Canaan, and blessed me, and said to me, Behold, I will make thee fruitful, and multiply thee, and I will make of thee a multitude of people, and will give this land to thy seed after thee for an everlasting possession. So he's uh, referring to where God appeared to him at Bethel twice, and where God gave to him the promises of his forefathers, Abraham and Isaac about making him a company of nations. And, uh, and he says, And now thy two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born unto thee in the land of Egypt, before I came unto thee in, into Egypt, are mine. As Reuben and Simon, or Simeon, they shall be mine. So, Now, when Joseph was sold into Egypt by his brothers, he ended up um, meeting the Pharaoh and becoming a leader. And he was given a wife from the priest of On in Egypt. So he, he took an Egyptian wife and he had these two sons in Egypt with her. And Jacob, or Israel, has now come to Egypt, and for the first time he has met these two sons. Now, if most people remember that um, Jacob had two wives who were sisters. The older one was Leah, and the younger one was Rachel. And um, he had, uh, how many? Four sons with Leah. And then he had other sons with Leah's servant girl. And then he had sons with Rachel's servant girl. And then his youngest two sons were born of Rachel. Uh, the, the oldest was Joseph. And the younger one was Benjamin, who uh, Rachel died, died in childbirth, giving birth to Benjamin. So Joseph and Benjamin were the youngest two, and Joseph was taken to Egypt. Now, the oldest two sons from Leah, Jacob's two firstborn, were Reuben and Simeon. So he's saying here, your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, are going to be my sons, just like Reuben and Simeon. They shall be mine. So I guess what he's saying is that these are going to be considered the first and second born, just as Reuben and Simeon are the first and second born. And, thy, and then starting in verse 6, 
and thy issue which thou begets after them shall be thine, and shall be called after the name of their brethren in their inheritance. Which is, uh, they ended up being the, the tribe of Ephraim and the tribe of Manasseh, who were the children of these two men. Um, they became known as the house of Joseph. And then he says in verse 7, And as for me, when I came from Padan, Rachel died by me in the land of Canaan in the way, when yet there was but a little way to come to Ephrath. And I buried her there in the way of Ephrath, the same is Bethlehem. So he's talking to Joseph about his mother, who died when she gave birth to Benjamin. And she's buried in Bethlehem. And um, I have this video that I made about Rachel and Ephrath. is um, episode 17, part 7 of 7. Okay. Now, going into verse 8, and Israel, now he's... That was Jacob talking. Now he's Israel. He's speaking as Israel, who is the new man, the man transformed by the Spirit of God. And Israel beheld Joseph's sons and said, Who are these? And Joseph said to his father, They are my sons, whom God has given me in this place. And he said, Bring them, I pray thee, unto me, and I will bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim for age, so that he could not see. And he brought them near to him, and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I had not thought to see thy face, and lo, God has showed me also thy seed. And Joseph brought them out from between his knees, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim, in his right hand toward Israel's left hand and Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand and brought them near to him. Okay, so Joseph has Ephraim in his right hand and Manasseh in his left hand and he's facing his father Israel so that Ephraim is on Israel's left and Manasseh is on Israel's right. Now Manasseh was the older son. So now Israel crossed his hands like this and put his hands on the two sons when he began to bless them. Now the, the right and the left in this culture is, uh, is pretty important. The, the right hand is the strong hand. And that's like the, um, it represents the discipline and the law, um, where the left hand is more of the uh, holding your possessions and holding your uh, values and protecting the things that belong to you while you fight with your right. Well, you fight with your right hand. You protect things with your left. Um, so the, the right hand is the hand of strength and power. And Joseph is bringing Manasseh to Israel's right hand. As the firstborn, he gets, he's supposed to be getting the greater blessing. But Israel crosses his hands and blesses them so he puts his right hand on Ephraim, the younger son. So, and Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God who fed me all my life long unto this day. 
Because Joseph, when Joseph sent a message to Jacob to come to Egypt, he, during the famine, he said, and I will feed you the rest of your life. So um, here Israel is saying, God fed me all of my life. And the angel which redeemed me from all evil blessed the lads and met, let my name be named on them. So he's speaking as Israel. So let the name of Israel be named on them. And the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. So this is, he's placing upon him the blessing that God gave to him as Israel on his second visit to Bethel. And it's a, the, the blessing of becoming a multitude in the midst of the earth. And when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. And he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. And Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his, she and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. And he blessed them that day, saying, In thee shall Israel bless, saying, God make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And he set Ephraim before Manasseh. And Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I die, but God shall be with you and bring you again into the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to thee one portion above thy brothers, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and, my, and with my bow. All right, so there's a few principles going on here. First of all, the principle of setting the secondborn over the firstborn. This has been done in Abraham. Uh, Abraham had a son first who was named Ishmael, but he was not the promised son by God. Um, he was born to the slave girl of Abraham and his wife. It was Abraham trying to fulfill God's promise with his own strength. And God told him, that is not the son that I promised you. And then the, the second born of Abraham, who was Isaac, was actually the promised son. And this also happened with Isaac, who had two sons, who were twins, uh, who was Izu and Jacob. And Izu actually came out first, but Jacob uh, was the one who ended up with the blessing and, and being renamed Israel. So now he's bringing this same principle on to Ephraim and Manasseh. This, this, the, the second born will be greater than the first born. So uh, this is carrying on a tradition of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he's also giving them the blessing of becoming a company of nations or a multitude of nations. Um, now the other thing he said that I have given to thee uh, one portion above your brothers which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and my bow. When did Jacob or Israel take uh, land out of the hand of the Amorite? The Amorite are the Canaanites, right? The Amaru. Um, and that happened actually if we can look it up here, Genesis um, 34, 25, when they took the town, when they murdered all the men in the town of Shechem, when 
the the young the king's son from that Canaanite city raped their sister and they told them uh, he can marry her only if all the men of the town become circumcised and then when it, they all became circumcised uh, they went and when they were all um, hurting from being circumcised they went and slaughtered all the men of the town and uh, <clears throat> in uh, Genesis chapter 34 verse 27 we see and the sons of Jacob came upon the slain and spoiled the city because they had defiled their sister they took their sheep and their oxen and their asses and that which was in the city and that which was in the field and all their wealth and all their little ones and their wives took they captive and spoiled even all that was in the house and Jacob said to Simeon and Levi you have troubled me to make me to stink among the, among the inhabitants of the land among the Canaanites and the Perizzites and I being few in number they shall gather themselves together against me and slay me and I shall be destroyed I and my house now Jacob didn't like what they did but uh, regardless he had uh, received that town and that land as his possession because of what they did and that is proven in Joshua chapter 24 verse 32 and the bones of Joseph which the children of Israel brought up out of Egypt buried they in Shechem in a parcel of ground which Jacob bought of the sons of Hamar, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of silver, and it became the inheritance of the children of Joseph. So, that is the land he's talking about, is the extra portion. So, now to, to dig in a little bit deeper into this thing about Ephraim and Manasseh, Becoming a company of nations in the earth. We have to look at a little bit further um, to the next event that took place in Genesis chapter 49. Now Genesis chapter 49 is where Jacob, before he dies, he call, calls together all 12 of his sons. And he gives each one of them a blessing. And, or a cursing, some of them. And we're not going to look at all the 12 sons in this episode, but we're going to take a look at the son Joseph, what he said to Joseph. Now Joseph had just received these blessings of his two sons who become the house of Joseph, and they received a portion above the portion of their brothers. And so now Joseph has become two instead of one. Because instead of one son, Joseph, he received two blessings of one of, of his two sons. Okay, so now when he comes to Joseph, he says, Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well, whose branches run over the wall. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him, but his bow abode in strength and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob from there is the shepherd the stone of Israel even by the God of thy father who shall help thee and by the Almighty who shall bless thee with the blessings of heaven above blessings of the deep that lies under blessing of the breasts and of the womb that means many children and the deep underneath is the, the the bounty of the sea right the heavens above the bounty of the air the blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors so he's saying the the blessings that from for you are even greater than the blessings that I received from my fathers, Abraham and Isaac. 
unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be upon the head of Joseph, and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brothers. So Joseph was separated from his brothers when he was sold into slavery, and he received the crown on his head, the crown of Egypt, actually. So let's take a quick look at what some of these things mean. Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well. So it's a, a, it's a branch that's growing by a well, which is well watered, and it grows so much that it grows right over the wall. So it goes beyond its own borders. The archers or, or warriors have have uh, grieved him and shot at him and hated him but they couldn't stop him and he became strong right um, so what is this talking about and now we're going if we refer back to the videos I mentioned earlier if you look at the video on the day of Jezreel and the video about Bethlehem of Ephrathah you will understand how um, there's a new Israel, the, the old northern kingdom of Israel, the lost ten tribes that were taken away by Assyria. They were taken away forever. And, and Israel had been turned into a new concept. It's a spiritual Israel, which is basically Christianity. Now, we'll take a look at when he talks about the fruitful bough by a well. And now we'll turn to the Gospel of John. We'll take a look at the Gospel of John, chapter 4. Okay? Now, this talks about the Samaritans. And who are the Samaritans? When the, when the king of Assyria, Tiglath-Pilasar III, in 721 BC, he invaded the north, northern kingdom of Israel, and he took away the ten tribes into slavery. And as was a Assyrian custom, he brought other people whom he had taken away from their homeland somewhere else, and he placed them in that land, in Israel. And these people became known as the Samaritans. Um, now, when they came into the land, they asked, Who is the God of this land? Because... Whenever you came into a new land, it was important to appease the gods of that land. And they found out that the god of that land was Yahweh. And they learned all about Yahweh. But they didn't um, join up with the nation of Judah, There's the southern kingdom of Judah. They sort of made their own Israel. And they made their own temple. And they... Um, sort of made their own religion based loosely upon the laws of Moses and the teachings of Yahweh. And um, this caused a great division between the Jews and the Samaritans. And this was the, the reason Jews never spoke to Samaritans. They didn't touch them. They, the Samaritans were like the gypsies. They were like the the, the, the ghetto people, they were false Israelites. They, they, claimed to be Israel, they claimed to be Israelites, but they were not Israelites. This was the problem the Jews had at that time. So that's the background of what a Samaritan was during the time of Jesus. They, they were very much shunned by the Jews as like imposters. And, and the Samaritans, they claimed that they were, they thought they were actually Israelites by this time. This is about, um, well, 700 years later. And uh, we'll see how this woman at the well, she talks as if she actually is a, a, a descendant of Jacob. But in reality, they weren't. They were brought in by Tiglath-Pileser III. Okay, John chapter 4, Samaritan at woman at the well. Okay, when therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, 
though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples did. He left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs to go through Samaria. And then he comes to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Okay, so this is Shechem. So the, he, Jesus is going through Shechem, which was occupied at this time by the Samaritans. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well. And it was about the sixth hour. And there came a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then said the woman of Samaria to him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, asked a drink from me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked of him, and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From where then have you that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank of it himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water shall thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, that I thirst not, neither come here to draw. And Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have said well, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and he who you now have is not your husband. And you have spoken truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour comes when you shall neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship you know not what. We know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. But the hour comes, and now is, because he's here now, and the hour comes when he's going to be crucified, and now is, because he's on the earth preaching, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeks such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You see, so now it's becoming a physical thing. He's not even arguing with this woman about being the actual descendant of Jacob. He just says, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, salvation is of the Jews, but the hour is coming, like the hour of his crucifixion, when it will neither be Jerusalem or Shechem. Okay, And the, word, the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah comes, which is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I that speak unto you am he. So people always say Jesus never actually said that he was the Messiah. Right here he came right out and says it. Okay. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, what, seek, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? Because, you know, as far as the Jews were concerned, there would only be one reason that a Jew would talk to a Samaritan woman, right? 
So, but they were all like really surprised he was talking to her, like Jesus is talking to her. And, but nobody wanted to say anything. The woman then left her water pot and went her way to the city and said to the men, Come and see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? And they went out of the city and came to him. And meanwhile his disciples pray, prayed him, saying, Master, eat. And he said to them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Has any man brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Say you not there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reaps receives wages and gathers fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reaps may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that whereon you bestowed no labor. Other men labored and you are entered into their labors. See, they have been, the, these disciples were Jews. They had never done anything to teach Samaritans anything about God. Then he's saying, now you get to reap where others have sown. Okay, and many of the Samaritans of the city believed in him. For the saying of the woman which testified, he told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans were come to him, they besought him that he would tarry with them. And he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. And said to the woman, Now we believe not because of your saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this indeed is the Christ, the Savior of the world. Okay, so this is speaking of the Joseph being a fruitful bough by a well. Now this is in the land of Joseph's inheritance, the house of Joseph, the land of Shechem. And it's the Samaritan people who are not actually descendants, physical descendants of Jacob or Abraham. They're from some other place. The, the, the tiglath Pileser the third settled them in there from some other place. It, we don't even know where they were from. And the ten tribes are gone. They were taken out of there. That was the northern kingdom of Israel. So Jesus is bringing salvation to the Samaritans as if they are Jews. And he is saving them. Um, he didn't do that for Gentiles. He did it only for Jews and Samaritans. So he said, I only go to the lost tribes of the house, house of Israel. Is that what he, he kept on saying? Until after his crucifixion, then the gospel went to the Gentiles. So he's preaching to the Samaritans as if they are part of the nation of Israel. And I think it might have something to do with um, they are technically are not children of Israel or Abraham by blood, but God is honoring the fact that they wanted to honor God and they came in and they adapted the religion of Jehovah. And um, God is honoring them, even though they are not technically the children of Abraham. But he's treating them as they were because they believe in Christ. And this ties right in, as I said before, to those videos that I talked about earlier, the day of Jezreel and Bethlehem of Ephrathah, where in the Old Testament, it was all according to bloodline. But in the New Testament, with Christ and the gospel of Christ, it becomes according to belief, according to spirit. 
Those who worship God will worship him in spirit and in truth. It's not about bloodline anymore. This is also apparent in uh, the a verse in Galatians. Let's take a quick look. That's right. Galatians chapter 3, verse 6 and 7. Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know you therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham. So he's saying it's by faith, it's not by bloodlines, it's not by keeping laws, it's by faith. And we just saw that with the woman of the, at the well, the Samaritan woman, who was not, not the bloodline of Abraham, but she believed Jesus Christ. And the whole town of Shechem, who were not bloodline of Abraham, they believed Christ and they became Christians before he was crucified, before the gospel went to the Gentiles. So in this way, the um, non, it's not by blood, it's by faith, what was happening even before Christ was crucified. Now, um, Okay, now the, the other thing that uh, we were looking at in Genesis chapter 49 when, when uh, Jacob was talking about Joseph, verse 24, and he talks about from thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Um, now who is the shepherd, the stone of Israel? from Joseph. And I think this also ties to Christ. Um, that I'm not sure how he is. Oh, okay. If we, if you look at the, um, the video that I was talking about earlier, Bethlehem of Ephrathah, that shows how Christ is, ties in with Ephraim. Okay, and it's in a spiritual way. They're, they're children of the spirit, not of the flesh. And the stone of Israel is actually um, the, the stone of stumbling. If we look at Isaiah chapter 28, Isaiah chapter 28, verse 15 and 16, um, Here's God talking to Jerusalem and Israel. And he's saying, okay, I'll start in verse 14. Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scornful men that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. Because you have said, we have made a covenant with death, and with hell we are in agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come to us, for we have made lies our refuge. And under falsehood we have hid ourselves. Therefore thus says the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation a stone, a tried stone, a precious corner stone, a sure foundation. He that believes shall not make haste. And it, it, he also talks about this stone in Isaiah chapter 8. Verse 13 to 15. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, let him be your dread. And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling, and for a rock of offense, to both the houses of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. So the, the, um, the foundation stone is also a stone of stumbling. It's, it's a sanctuary to those who believe 
and it's a stumbling stone to those who don't believe um, for the men of Jerusalem. Now, what does the New Testament say about this stone of stumbling? There are a bunch of references. I'll probably do a video just about the stone of stumbling. But just to give you an idea of what the stone is talking about, the stone of Israel, and how it ties to Jesus Christ. We'll take a look at Romans chapter 9, verse 30 to 33. What shall we say then, that the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness? But Israel, or the Jews, which followed after the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. So he's saying, but because the Jews put all their trust in the law and rejected the teachings of Jesus, they stumbled on the stumbling stone. And Jesus talks about the stumbling stone. Matthew chapter 21, verse 23 to 46. Um, and yeah, I, I, I backed up a bit from where he talks about it to give the context here. Uh, so I'll just read it and you get it. And when he, starting in verse 23, Matthew chapter 21, And when he came to the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority do you these things? And who gave you this authority? And Jesus answered and said to them, I will ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I will in likewise tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, from where was it? From heaven or from men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why did you not believe him? But if we say of men, we fear the people. For all hold John as a prophet. And they answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. And he said to them, Well, neither can I tell you by what authority I do these things. And then he said, uh, Then he, he spoke a few parables, because he always spoke in parables, uh, so that believers and people who are spiritually minded would understand what he's talking about. But these teachers and these legalist authorities in Jerusalem would not understand him. Okay, so here's the parable. What do you think? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go to work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But after, afterward he repented and went. And he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I'll go, sir, but he went not. He said, Which of them did the will of his father? They said to him, The first. And Jesus said to them, Verily I say unto you that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you didn't believe him. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. And you, when you had seen it, repented not afterwards that you might believe him. So they are the ones who repented not. So so the, the public, publicans and the harlots are the ones who said uh, that they would not do it, but then they repented and did it. Where they are the ones who said they would do it, but they didn't do it. Okay, and he said, here another parable. Now he's talking about how the, the, the Jews are losing the oracles of God and it is being given to another, which is the Christians. 
Okay, here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went to a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants and beat one, killed another, stoned another. Again he sent other servants more than the first, and they did to him likewise. But last of all he sent to them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him, and cast him out of the vineyard, and slew him. When the Lord therefore of the vineyard comes, what will he do unto those husbandmen? And they said to him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men, and will let out his vineyard to other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. And Jesus said to them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same as become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whoever shall fall upon this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spoke of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude, because they took him to, for, to be a prophet. So they wanted to grab him and throw him in prison, but the people all believed he was a prophet, so they couldn't do it. Um, so this shows that Jesus himself is identifying himself as the stone. I am the stone, right? So this is the stone of Israel. Now, the, there's one more thing I wanted to talk about. Uh, regarding this teaching of Christianity, okay? Now, Ephraim and Manasseh, were, or especially Ephraim, was given the prophecy of becoming a company of nations spread out through the earth. And we know that Ephraim is actually, by the prophecy of the day of Jezreel and other prophecies, which I haven't really covered yet, but that one should be enough to show that um, Christianity is the new Israel. It's the spiritual Israel. Now, this spiritual Israel is attached to a company of nations in the earth. Um, in the last episode, I talked a lot about the uh, Christianity, the history of Christianity, uh, becoming a Roman Catholic and then Protestant and Catholic. Um, now that's an interesting thing of Joseph had a crown of Egypt. If you look at the Pope, he's, his crown and his gown and all these rituals, it's all Egyptian. All of it comes from Egypt. So that's an interesting fact. And... Um, but it morphed into uh, um, Protestantism, which is more geared to um, studying the scriptures and actually, you know, learning about the Bible and not about Catholic traditions. So when, when Protestantism um, became large, it was in the British Empire, was the main... Um, there was parts of Europe and Germany, more in the north, and Catholicism was more in the south and, and in France and Italy and Austria. Um, but the British Empire became the, the powerhouse after that time and during the time of co colonialism. And um, they had colonies all over the world. They had Canada and Australia and India 
and um, other parts of the world. Now, um, after World War I, India became more um, agitated. Uh, they, they wanted their freedom. Um, probably because there was a lot of talk of freedom among the British, and India wanted its freedom. And the, Br the British sort of carved up India into India and Pakistan because it was the Hindus and the Muslims the, uh, never getting along with each other. So they, they made Pakistan for the Muslims and India for the Hindus. And there was a great um, movement of people where m most of the Muslims moved into Pakistan and most of the Hindus moved out of Pakistan into India. And they, they had some uh, great battles. There was a lot of bloodshed between them. And the British were sort of involved in the middle of that. And um, in other parts of the world, after World War II, the dominions of the British Empire started to, um, you know, want to be more independent and more uh, sovereign nations unto themselves, like Canada and Australia and South Africa. Um, they all, because America was a free nation and France was a free nation, Germany was a free nation, they all uh, want, said, well, we should be free nations too. I know as a Canadian, Canada has... Um, uh, a lot of history from World War II is when uh, Canada started to gain uh, an independent spirit as being the Canadians were like a, a fighting force. They were the third largest behind um, USA and Britain. Canada was the third largest and Australia was also a large fighting force. So all these colonies or these dominions of Britain started to have a more independent look and, and, and uh, a desire for independence. And this turned into the Commonwealth of Nations. Now the British Empire and the United States were uh, mostly Christian and mostly based upon Christian values and Christian history. And also Europe. Europe is, is also a company of nations which are pretty, pretty uh, predominantly Christian. So when you think about Ephraim becoming a company of nations spread out through the earth, you can think of um, the dominions and the, the commonwealth of nations, which are all Christian. And then there's the... Uh, the European Union, which is a company of Christian nations. And, it, and even if you think of the United States, even though it is one nation, it is actually, uh, it's not based upon a bloodline. It's not based upon a race. It is a collection of every race and every people, nation, and tongue all joining in with this nation based upon a common set of values which, which are geared around personal liberty and freedom. So this can also be viewed as a company of nations. So there is um, some fulfillment. There's a physical, it's like the physical world is like a shadow of spirit, of what happens spiritually. So spiritually, in Christianity includes all men who believe, no matter where they came from. And the, the physical world is reflecting that, where these nations of like-minded people are formed around the earth. And if you look at, you know, who is in control or who is the, who has the upper hand in the earth, you would have to say it's the Christian nations are pretty much calling the shots. Uh, America obviously is the most powerful, but it's not only that. 
is the other Christian nations who hold similar values are all together this company of nations that are calling the shots in the earth. So this is very much to me a fulfillment of prophecy towards Ephraim, who is Christianity, the, the spiritual Israel. Now this doesn't cut off the Jews, as um, people tend to start to talk about. The Jews are still descendants of Abraham. So they still have a, a, uh, a claim to, as far as God is concerned, they still have a claim from their physical attachment to Abraham. But their, God has also set up this spiritual Israel, which is, uh, wh who, who, by the way, are helping the Jews uh, militarily and socially and politically to um, have the strength and historically they put them back into their land which is another fulfillment of prophecy which we can look at at another time so um, in the next video we're going to start getting into Genesis chapter 49 where Jacob talks to each one of his sons and prophesies over them and we'll get a little bit deeper into this. But that covers sort of the blessing upon Joseph and Ephraim and Manasseh. And I encourage you to watch that seven video series that I uh, put out. It's episode 17. There's seven videos that talk about the, uh, the history of the ancient tribe of Manasseh and Ephraim. Manasseh was, uh, had the most land in Israel. In the ancient times but Manasseh is pretty much done and gone that was the lesser of the two where Ephraim actually becomes representing Israel uh, uh, the spiritual Israel of Christianity which is huge it's a the company of nations in these times so we'll see you in the next video and thank you very much. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe on the video uh, to help the algorithms and all that stuff. Thank you very much.